Okay. So welcome to the slideshow on investments. <clears throat> so I think that if, um, if we were to go back and, and if the Bible were written by an economist, <laughs> it would start in the beginning, there were wages. <laughs> Um, because everything starts with, uh, with your income. Everything starts with your wages. You know, that's how we make money. And basically there's only two things you can do once you do get paid. Uh, once you do have your wages, you can choose to spend it now, which we call consumption, or you can choose to save it and spend it later, which is really what investment is about. Okay. Now, in terms of investments, you really only have two basic choices here as well. Uh, and your two choices that you have to ask yourself, do you want to be a lender or do you want to be an owner? Because those are the only two choices that you have. You can either lend your money and earn interest uh, or you can have an own, you can be an ownership. You can have, you can own whether it's real property or financial assets. Those are the only two choices you have for investments. So we're gonna look at all of those types of things in, um, in the big picture. So if you're a lender, you really sort of have two uh, choices um, that we're gonna be looking at. So short-term lending is what we call the money market. And the money market is huge, it's quite huge. And I used to work in this particular market when I was uh, in, in investments as a younger man. Um, and so the money market is short-term lending. And as you'll see, there are a few big players in the money market and only a few. Um, the banking system uh, is, is definitely in it. The, uh, the United States government does a lot of short, needs a lot of short-term cash. And so they're part of the money market and extremely large corporations are also part of that. So we're going to be looking at that first. And again, this is short term. Money market is short term, less than a year. Okay. <clears throat> and then if you're looking to be a long term lender, well, that's what the bond market is. Uh, the bond market is for long term lending uh, purposes. And um, there's a lot of big players in the long term bond market. Um, certainly the you know, United States government is there. Uh, corporations go to the bond market to uh, raise money as well. Um, and state and local governments, what we call municipalities, are, are there as well. Uh, and then you have the ownership market. So the lending markets are revolving around these two, which we're going to look at first. The owner, there's a lot of ownership markets. And uh, the one we'll focus on, of course, is the stock market, which is the ownership of <clears throat> uh, shares of ownership in corporations. And that is the only thing that's happening on the stock market. Um, but there's a lot of other ownership markets, uh, real estate or real property, commodities, uh, currency, collectibles. There's a whole bunch of other ownership markets that we're really not gonna get into in this particular course. We're gonna focus more on, on the stock market. So again, these are your two choices. You know, you can either be a lender um, uh, or an owner. You know you're a lender when there's interest involved. So it's really all about that interest rate. <clears throat> Ownership uh, is slightly different. So let's take a look at the lending markets first, okay? Uh, as I write here, uh, yeah, okay, like uh, what's a lender? Um, I think I was in a California kick at this point when I wrote this uh, slide out. Um, and so basically a lender, you're letting someone borrow money. Um, and what do you get in exchange for that? You, you'll get an interest rate. You'll get interest on your money. And uh, many of you are already, like I said, all of you are lenders. If you have a savings account or, uh, or another account, you already are a lender. Because if you have a savings account at your local bank, uh, that's your money. And they are paying you interest on that money, which is why you were a lender, why you made, you made a loan to the bank. It's your money, not the bank's money. Um, uh, there are also certificate of deposits, uh, longer term savings accounts, as I like to look at them, um, that you promise not to touch for a period of time, and then you get higher interest. Uh, although today, what constitutes higher interest, uh, most people would 
you know, with my history, would kind of laugh at. Uh, we're really getting very little, like one tenth of one percent or, or so on our on our rates. Although rates are ticking up a little bit these days. Um, so we are in we are kind of in the lending market already with our with our bank products. Um, the money market is, is like I said, it's quite big and it's dominated really by um, just a few big players. Um, and you personally can be a lender if you if you buy a treasury bill. Um, United States treasury bills are short term uh, loans to the federal government. Short term because uh, you can let them borrow it for as little as a month. Uh, you can let them borrow it for as little uh, or as long as a year, but it's no longer than that. And so they're they're part of that short term lending market, which is what the money market is. And of course, you probably have all have heard of money market accounts uh, at banks or money market mutual funds. Um, but these uh, these funds are also uh, benefiting from investments in the money market. Um, could be as little as an overnight loan, a loan for a few weeks, a few months, but no greater than a year. And then the long-term market, uh, lending market is, is the bond market. And there's lots of different options. Uh, some people might have already had, um, uh, perhaps when they were younger, they might have gotten savings bonds or uh, maybe, you know, a lot of people used to think of these as good gifts for, for kids um, to have that. But savings bonds are basically long-term loans to the federal government, to the United States government, um, in exchange for, for interest on that. Um, but the government itself, the United States government, issues all types of, of lending instruments. Bonds tend to be long-term, like 30 years. Um, Ones that are a little bit shorter, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, those are called treasury notes. But they're both loans to the United States government. Um, corporations of all sorts, large, small, uh, financially stable, financially risky, go to the lending markets and ask investors to lend it money in the form of a corporate bond. Uh, and so we're gonna, be folk, we're gonna be learning a lot about this too as well. Um, state governments, local governments um, borrow money all the time. I um, mean, it's not like you've probably been over the, uh, the new uh, Tap and Z Bridge, what they've renamed Maricomo Bridge. Um, you know, it's not like the state had, you know, a couple of billion dollars hanging out that they could just say, oh, let's, let's build a bridge or get some money for it. They actually went to lenders. They went to the bond market to ask for loans um, to pay for for those types of things. There's uh, at least over the last 10 years that I've been in New York, there's been at least one new building built on every SUNY campus. Um, and guess what? SUNY doesn't have the money for that. So they also went to the bond market and said, look, could you loan us the money? We wanna build these buildings and we will pay you back over the years with our tuition and other revenue. Uh, for our case at Duchess, we built the dorm. Uh, the dorm is a loan uh, that we borrowed. It's a municipal bond, technically. Um, and so, and of course, state states and, and large cities also borrow money uh, for a number of different things. And so those are municipal bonds. Um, and then, of course, you can, uh, you might have heard of uh, bond mutual funds. Um, and again, these are investments in a number of different bonds. Uh, they can be U.S. bonds which are domestic, or they can be international or global. So you can, uh, foreign corporations, foreign governments also borrow money in the same way that we do here, works the same. So there's lots of actual choices if you're gonna be a lender, lots of choices here. So let's take a look at, uh, at what makes sense for, for some folks. Um, first of all, um, the money market, I would say this is exceptionally safe market for someone who's worked in it for a few years uh, in the past. Um, these are, you have to be a huge, huge player uh, to be in the money market. Uh, no one's gonna lend your money overnight unless, or, or even over a weekend or up for a year, unless you're huge, you're huge. Um, and so these are loans uh, anywhere from overnight to no more than a year in duration. 
Um, like I was telling you, many bank products are part of this. Um, you know, like your savings account, checking out these are, these are short term. Um, but I'm really interested in un giving you an understanding of, of what players are in the money market and how money market funds invest in that. So uh, the United States government borrows money all the time to pay its bills. Now they do have enormous amounts of money coming in. Uh, I think at last count it was around three and a half trillion dollars of money they collect. The problem is they spend four and a half trillion. So, <laughs> um, and so they need cash to, um, to pay their bills as they're going month to month. And they also need to borrow longer term to finance the debt that they have what we call the national debt. Uh, it's really just an enormous group of bonds put together. Um, and so United States Treasury bills are basically risk-free loans. The government guarantees um, payment on that. There's absolutely no risk. There's no insurance, but why? You don't need insurance because the government prints the money. Uh, and so if they promise to pay you back, it's as good as the money that was printed on. And so, so far the government's had a really good track record of paying its debts and as long as it keeps doing that uh, it can borrow almost as much as it wants um, and so here these are risk-free loans to the government and again uh, these are no longer than a year um, for this case large corporations and I mean super large mega large um, borrow money for you know from each other as well uh, whether it's overnight, over the weekend, over a few weeks, a month, a few months, or no longer than, you know, it's no longer than nine months in this case. It can't be longer than nine months. Now, those loans between large corporations is what we call commercial paper. Um, and it simply is a loan agreement, short-term loan agreement between corporations. They have to be very, very large. I'm talking like Disney, Walmart, Microsoft large. Okay? I'm not talking about your local a uh, small corporation, they probably wouldn't be able to get anything there. Um, banks are really, really good at lending money to each other. Um, some banks, as you know, get a lot of deposits during a day. So they're, they're flush with cash. They have more deposits than withdrawals. And then there are other banks, and there are thousands of banks around the country. There are other banks that have many withdrawals and not as many deposits. So they they need to, you know, find money to balance out. You know that if anyone's you've been a cashier, you got to balance your drawer at the end of the day. Well, think about that. Every bank simply has to balance at the end of every day. So if there's one bank that has too many withdrawals, uh, they're looking to borrow money. If there's another bank that has too many deposits, they're looking to invest that money. And they do so by lending it to each other uh, through the banking system. And that's basically how Fed funds works. Um, a lot of you have taken economics or will be taking economics. You'll hear about uh, the Fed funds rate. Uh, and basically banks, it, these are also, again, they're not guaranteed loans, but they're just as good as guaranteed. I mean, it, there's really not that much risk uh, in terms of the money market because of the players you know, that are involved. Uh, there are other types of instruments that are based on banks, uh, bank loans um, that, are, uh, that are part of the money market. So the money market fund, short term, because it's short term and it's less risky, uh, the percent uh, interest you're going to get on a money market is very low. It's very low. Uh, so you can make a return on money in the money market. You can lend your money in the money market simply by putting your money in a money market fund. Um, but the, the reward, in essence, is very low because the risk is very low. Uh, it's... I don't think it's, I think it's highly unusual if I've ever heard of anyone losing money in the money market. Um, so in essence, uh, it is close to as no risk a deal as you can be. Uh, but again, no risk, there's not much of a reward. So bonds are long-term loans from investors like you and me. Okay? Uh, what's long-term, more than a year? Um, in the government, uh, it's up to 30 years. 30-year government uh, treasury bond is a 30-year bond. Corporations borrow money uh, usually between 10 and 20 years. It's very rare that that's longer than that. Um, <clears throat> but it is a loan. 
It is a loan. So it's a, where does the loan is from the investors like you and me. So we have choices on who we want to lend money for the long term. Uh, could be to a corporation, could be to the federal government, could be to a state or local government, which is called a municipality. So how it works basically is bondholders lend money. Now the, the, the smallest loan you can make is $1,000, okay? The smallest loan you can make, one bond is a $1,000 loan. So what you get in exchange for that $1,000 is you might give the loan today, it might be due 10 years from today, so 2030. Right. Well, what happens between the time you make the loan now in 2020 and when you get your loan back in 2030? Well, you'll get interest payments. You'll get interest payments. It's periodic. Uh, it's usually every six months you'll get a check sent to you um, for the interest on the loan that you made. Okay. And then, of course, you'll get that $1,000 back when the loan comes due, which we call a maturity date. Okay. So bonds are attractive to people who want to have a steady flow of income payments over time, okay? And so that's, in essence, what a bondholder is looking for. They want to give these loans because in exchange for the loan, they're going to be getting a regular payment over time. Now, you know, investing just $1,000 isn't going to quite cut it. Um, Normally you have to do a number of different loans so you can stagger them. So you're actually getting a check every month. And a lot of, comp a lot of people will do that or used to do that with a broker. Now bond funds do all that type of thing for you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and again, bond funds are, are investing in these areas as well. Okay. So your choices and the risk level is important to understand um, there is no risk with the U.S. government. Uh, it's the safest choice because they print the money. And so uh, they'll always have a chance to pay people back because they can simply start the printing presses right up. Uh, they guarantee it, and as long as they guarantee it and they pay, there's no risk. Um, government agencies um, are also very safe choices only because the government, the U.S. government keeps bailing them out. And so as long as they keep bailing them out, uh, there's no risk. Uh, that's the thing. Should they bail them out? We can argue, we can debate, but, uh, but the fact is they have been bailing out um, their, their agencies. Uh, and so that's, uh, that makes it a safe choice, not the safest, but it's a safe choice in essence. Loans to state and local governments are also safe choices. And that's because uh, as part of the process of raising money from lenders, lenders require those states insure the bond. So actually, when you're lending your money to the state of New York or the city of New York or whatever, uh, or to SUNY, for, exact, for that matter, uh, when, before they actually can issue the bond to you, what's one of the things that is usually required is they have insurance on that. They have insurance on that. So they, in essence, are trying to guarantee the lenders with that insurance policy, they're going to guarantee you that they're going to pay you back. They have insurance on it. So that makes them a very safe choice. Most municipalities, I mean, there's very rare, there has been instances, but there's very rare, um, it's rarely that a municipality goes under or, or cannot pay its bills, cannot pay its debt. Um, it, it does happen. It has happened in the past. Uh, but thankfully, it's a very rare event, which means most of them are, are quite safe. And again, a municipality could be uh, the actual state, and we have 50 of them to choose from, right? Uh, can be a city, or it can be a regional authority within the state, like I said, SUNY is one. Um, or a tur the Turnpike Authority is another. I mean, uh, almost every state has a Turnpike Authority of some sort. They borrow money all the time, um, you know. And so that's it. And the wonderful thing about municipal bonds, if you're lending your money to the state or city, particularly if you live in it, all the, in, all the interest you get is tax-free. They're not taxing you on that. Um, and so they do make uh, an attractive choice for that. But because they are tax-free, the people who really benefit are exceptionally wealthy individuals because they're the ones that are going to make a lot of money on this and they don't want to pay taxes on it. So municipal bonds are great if you're super wealthy, 
uh, for you and I, or most people that are sort of in the category of not wealthy, uh, municipal bonds are just not as attractive as other options. Corporations. Okay, well, here's, here's the fun part. And I'm talking all different types of corporations go to the bond market to raise money <clears throat> for themselves. And so some of the corporations could be quite um, financially healthy, very large corporations. And in essence, they're safe to lend money because they, they have a track record of paying it back. They're very big, strong corporations that can weather all the economic storms that are thrown at them. And there's some corporations that actually are struggling and are still looking for money. They need money to survive. Uh, some of those might be newer corporations or older corporations that are in trouble and they might need to borrow money. And they're looking for investors to borrow money. So corporations run the gamut from very safe to very risky, uh, depending on their financial condition. Well, how does an investor know what the financial condition of a corporation is? Ah, well, you should understand that corporations are actually rated <clears throat> by various agencies for financial strength. So you and I are rated by our FICO scores and our credit scores. Um, you have a credit score, I have a credit score. That tells lenders how risky we are or how safe it is to give us a loan. Well, there are companies like Standard & Poor's, like Moody's, like Fitch, that actually uh, do their financial analysis on corporations and give them a ranking. The rankings are usually letter grades, <clears throat> uh, starting with triple A, double A, single A, triple B, double B, things like this. And basically, triple uh, A is the strongest financial uh, strength company. They, they have all their ducks are in a row, everything looks fantastic. They're a low risk, give them a loan. But if you're giving a loan with no risk or very low risk, you're not going to make a lot of money. You can't demand a high interest rate uh, with, a, uh, with a lender. From a lender, you're the lender in this case, from a, from a company who's not, um, who's not risky. Just like you and I, if we had high credit scores, we're not risky. We should be getting the lowest interest rates on the loans. Well, on the other hand, there are companies, just like there are people that are risky to lend money to. They have a, a low credit rating or a low credit score. Well, then what are you gonna do if you're a lender? Well, you can still lend them money, but I'm sure you're gonna wanna have a higher interest rate attached to the loan. Uh, why higher interest rate? Because you're taking more risk and you wanna be compensated for that risk as an investor. So, uh, so these are considered high yield. Uh, we used to call them back in the day junk bonds, but you know, uh, this is really not a great way to market uh, yourself. If, hey, I got these junk bonds. You know, I wanna buy some junk. No one wants to buy junk, right? Um, so they changed it to something called high yield uh, because it just sounds a hell of a lot better. It's, more, it's easier to market, it's easier to sell and get investors interested versus saying, I got some junk for you. No one wants it. Um, so again, these corporations are risky because they might already have a high level of debt. They might be financially in a bad position. So it's speculative, it's, it's risky, it's risky. Um, and so again, corporations like people have their own version of a credit score. And that means that investors who are lending money to corporations can know what type of risk they're taking when they lend their money. And then of course, like I said, um, there's a lot of uh, foreign corporations uh, and also foreign governments that also rely on, um, on investments from all over the world. And so you can also lend your money to a, a foreign corporation or a foreign government as well. Okay, so any questions uh, on the bond issue or, or money market? short-term lending, bond market, long-term lending, the difference is one year. Short-term is less than a year, long-term is greater than a year. Any general questions, you kind of understand what it's like to be a lender, in essence. And again, and this is for investors. This is for investors who are seeking to lend money. Okay, that's how we're looking at this. 
All right, so we're going to move on to the next uh, set of investments, which, which are stocks, okay, uh, in, in this presentation. Okay, so stock, as some of you already know, uh, the word stock is simply a share of ownership in a corporation. <clears throat> a share of ownership and stock means the same thing. They're interchangeable terms, interchangeable terms. Um, just like beef and steak are interchangeable terms. They're, they, they're, the same thing. they're the same thing. So basically speaking here, uh, the stock market uh, really represents a chance for investors to own uh, a share of, of a corporation, okay? Uh, common ownership is, is what we call common stock. So this is in essence what uh, companies sell uh, up front, we'll get through that process of how they actually do that when we look at some details in chapter 11, next class. Um, but in essence, uh, it's, <clears throat> it is common ownership and it's what it represents. Uh, why do corporations decide to sell shares of stock? Well, it, it, there's a lot of different reasons, but the number one reason is it's the easiest way to raise money to expand their business. And so uh, this is the best, and, and, and this is how investors are getting involved. They know that it's a way to raise money. Um, so what do you get from it for investing your money? You get these shares of ownership in the company. That's, that's for investors, that's what they're getting. Uh, why would investors actually be interested in that? Well, one of the biggest reasons is they wanna see their investment grow over time. So if you invested $10,000 in a company and you, and, and over time, say 10 years, 20 years, it did really, really well, you might have $50,000. You might have $100,000. I mean, that's called capital appreciation. The value of your ownership increases over time. Um, why, another reason why investors want to purchase uh, shares of ownership or stock is some of those uh, companies share their profit in the form of a dividend with the, uh, with the owners. And so in this case, when a corporation makes a profit, some corporations have a history of sharing that profit with owners, which are stockholders, in the form of a dividend. And dividends, unlike interest on bonds, which is paid every six months, dividends paid, are paid every three months for those companies that pay dividends. It's important to know that not every corporation pays dividends. Um, and it's oftentimes it's really not a ton of money, but it is extra money. So that's, that's a plus. There are different ways of looking at stock, how we classify stock based on really the risk level. Um, and a lot of people don't like to take a lot of risk, but they're interested in the stock market. So the best option, or what I call the more, most conservative option, uh, is to invest in the largest U.S. companies. And the largest U.S. companies are often referred to as blue chip stocks. Uh, now, some of you uh, might have a, a knowledge of, of poker. Um, and if uh, poker, you would bet with chips. And so the highest value chip that you can bet in a poker game is the blue chip. And so blue chip stocks come from that uh, idea. These are the largest corporations in value. In value. Uh, a lot of these corporations uh, are very large, they're very established, and they've also had an, a history of sharing profits with the owners in the form of a dividend. So sometimes they're also called income stocks. So they're stocks, they're ownership in a corporation, but they provide the owners with income because they share these dividends with them every three months. And so uh, again, that usually happens in, if the company is relatively large and stable, okay? So they do pay steady dividends. Um, and again, the blue chip stocks, these stocks tend to be the highest value shareholder wealth so you're talking about like Apple Computer, which their stockholders' equity is 
uh, valued over a trillion dollars. So the company is, uh, I think, the bluest of the blue chips. Uh, so again, less risk. It's not that there's no risk. You're an owner. Like anything else, things can go wrong. Uh, and the owners are the ones who have to deal with that. But it's significantly less risk. Well, there's a little bit more risk, but a little bit more excitement in something called a growth stock. Uh, these are companies that are growing in terms of their, their sales. So they, they are ex the number of stores is expanding. The number of customers is expanding. That's growth in essence, because the more people, the more companies sell, the more profits they make. That's usually sales revenue and profitability go together um, almost always. So these, these folks are expanding, you know, and that expansion means more customers, more sales, more profits. So their profitability tends to be much higher than the companies that are already established and already very, very large. How much bigger can they grow? They can still get bigger, but not as quickly as the growth stocks. So because the growth stocks can actually grow relatively quickly, it makes for um, what they consider a, a more interesting investment choice because you're taking a little bit more risk and oftentimes you're gonna get a little bit more reward if things work out your way. If they are expanding well, uh, their sales are increasing, their profits are increasing, the stock prices are gonna go up over time uh, as well. And so faster than a company that's already so big. Okay. So I have a question here. Uh, how much history? Um, that's a good question. I would look at the latest five to 10 year period of time. The longer the better, clearly, but uh, usually within that, the last five to 10 years, you can kind of get an understanding of where they're at and where they're going or what they're, and of course you read the annual report to find out what their plans are uh, to grow. Um, so that's uh, a growth stock. Uh, there are stocks that do well when the economy is not doing so well. Um, these are called defensive stocks. Uh, defensive stocks uh, tend to be, you know, more conservative than modern in terms of choices. And these companies do well when the economy is going down, when the economy is getting, going into recession or in recession. <clears throat> because you're gonna, there's winners everywhere. Doesn't matter if the economy is doing well, the economy is doing not so well. There are companies and industries that are, that are profiting from the situation. So defensive stocks these days, uh, you know, Walmart is doing really well. Um, the, the up and down of an economy. Uh, well, right now we, we just finished a, um, an 11 year growth period before, the, uh, before hitting a recession this year. Uh, it was quite extraordinary. Um, matter of fact, our last three expansions, wonder, well, when Clinton was president eight years, um, I'm sorry, Reagan eight years, uh, Clinton, we had almost 10 years. Um, Bush was about six, seven years. And then now it's just running out of 11 years. So it's, um, we've had these very long booms and these really tight crunches. And um, so the recessions tend to be pretty deep and, uh, but they're short, shorter than historically speaking. So what, do, you know, what do they mean that these companies tend to do well when the economy is going down? Well, people still need to eat. Uh, people still need basics. And so uh, in this case, look at our COVID situation here where the economy has collapsed. So Walmart is doing well because you, you still need to go shopping for various things and you're going to a lower price store. Dollar General, these stores are doing fantastic because you know, they're, they're relatively inexpensive and they're popping up all over the place. Um, of course, being COVID, Amazon is doing well because people are shopping more online uh, because they don't want to leave their home. Uh, companies, restaurants that have large takeout. Time. So, you know, Domino's wasn't really affected all that much by this, by this COVID thing because they've already had, they already had a very high level 
of sales that are out the door that are basically for pickup or delivery anyway. It's not like you go out to dinner, you know, hang out at a, at a Domino's. You could, but it's not likely. It's unlike, you know, uh, Applebee's or things like where you, that's the purpose of it is to go out and hang out. Um, <clears throat> so those stores have done quite well, uh, despite the economic downturn. Uh, you know, Home Depot, other stuff have, has done quite well because people are stuck at home and so they, they're looking for things to do. And so if you're stuck at home and you're looking for things to do, you might as well, you know, fix that closet or start fixing stuff around the house. And they do it themselves because they can't afford to hire anybody. So they go to a Home Depot like store. Um, uh, yeah, there's lots of different Oh, and another thing, you know, people are not buying as many new cars because as the economy goes down and people lose their job, uh, they're not buying new cars. But of course, they still need a car. We live in a country where you need a car to do almost anything. Uh, most of us do anyway. And so they're fixing their cars up. So the auto parts stores are doing quite well as well because it's easier to fix a car than buy a new one um, if you're worried about losing your job or if you did lose your job. So there's a lot of companies that fit into this category of defensive stocks, but they tend to do okay. You know, cereal companies, uh, you know, soap companies, just little washing your hair and face, uh, I hope, uh, during, you know, downturn. So there's, there's some basics that, that'll never go away. Um, there are some companies that actually follow the cycle. So this might be a little bit more toward Clark's questions. Uh, the economic cycle goes in ups and downs. Um, you know, we have, we have expansions, we peak, we have a recession, we bottom out, uh, we have a recovery, then we have an expansion, then we peak, then we have a recession, then we bottom out, then we have a recovery, expansion, you know, peak, etc. So the, the economy tends to work in these types of cycles. Uh, some, when the economy is going up, that's usually a sign when you know, there's a lot of people that have jobs. You can leave your job and get another one like that, no problem. Uh, and it's and you feel confident, so you're willing to spend money, and that means you're buying a new car, you're buying big items, and so cyclical. You know, automakers are really big in the cyclicals. You know, no one's buying new cars in a recession. Very few people can do that, but almost everyone's buying a new car when everyone's doing well. And so it's a cyclical stock. You can always tell how, what, what part of the, where are we in the economic cycle by look what's happening in Detroit and in the car industry. Um, if they're expanding various things um, uh, then selling more cars, things are looking good. But uh, lately they've been kind of narrowing things down, shuttering things down, um, keeping the production lower because more and more people lost their jobs and they just simply have not been selling their cars. And you know, too, from the advertising, they're giving away cars. Come on in, no money down. You don't have to pay them for three months. You know, shit, take the whole car for a year and let us know if you like it. I mean, it's ridiculous what they're doing, but you can always tell we're in a bad situation when companies are willing to practically give their product away and not even receive payment on it for a while. So uh, that's just a sign of desperation and, and so, Again, it's a, it's a moderately aggressive choice. It's risky. It's risky to follow these curves because you've got to basically time it. You've got to basically time it. Um, small cap stocks are, are very small companies that, are, that can be the next big company. You know? And there's a ton of them. There's tons and tons of small companies out there um, that have a, a small stockholder value. That's capitalization, small cap. And so, uh, but they, they, they could be the next Apple. They could be the next Facebook. They could be the next Amazon. You just don't know. You just don't know. So it's a very aggressive choice. If you're lucky, you do exceptionally well. If you're not so lucky, you lose your money. So it's an aggressive choice. But think about it <clears throat> as the smaller fish in an, in an economic pond. So if you look at if you look at a, a big lake and you know there's all different types of fish in the lake um, and times are tough, there's not a lot of food in, in, in the lake. Um, well, you know the bigger fish have a lot more options to survive than the smaller fish, <laughs> right? Because one thing, the bigger fish can eat the smaller fish. 
Um, and when there's food, the bigger fish are going to have the competitive advantage in getting that food versus a smaller fish. So the same thing with companies, very large companies, very large, large companies are like those big fish in the pond. They have ways of surviving even when things are not so great. Um, but these smaller companies, these smaller fish, they have a hard time surviving when things get tough. And so they're at most risk, they're at most risk of going out of business or they're uh, or at risk of continuing. And so they're risky, risky, risky investments. But when they do work out, they work out. They work out. Okay, we've got a question here. Uh, there are a lot more classifications. Yeah, we're going to be getting into that in uh, when I look at your, your book. Uh, we're going to go through the book thing. This is my little PowerPoint slideshow. Um, but we're gonna look at more options, yes, as we go. So there are, uh, basically investors look at the market in, in one of two ways, it's too bad. Uh, but they consider a bull market uh, when investors are very, very optim optimistic. Uh, there's a lot of purchasing of stock and the stock market values go up. And so if you can look at it from uh, if you just take the Trump term, we've been in a bull market. Uh, if you go back all the way to the Obama term, after the first year, uh, since then we've sort of been, we've been in a bull market since then as well. Uh, mostly because investors have been quite optimistic and stock prices have just risen tremendously over that period of time. Um, however, uh, you know, when investors are pessimistic, uh, they start selling their shares of stock and the market uh, starts, to, starts to decline. Now, bear markets don't happen in a day. Uh, so they have been very large dips in the market on, a t on occasion, it's been down a thousand points in a day. Yeah, okay, um, no problem. Bear markets are usually done over time. And so if you see that things are declining over the last year or so, uh, we're probably, you know, six months to a year, then that's probably a bear market. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been through many bear markets. Uh, we were in a mini bear when the COVID started and market values collapsed uh, quite a bit, I think 30% or so, if I remember correctly. Um, but that was short lived. It only lasted a few months until it rebounded. Uh, and now we're actually at the same levels that we were uh, back in, in March before stuff sort of collapsed. Uh, so bear marks don't have to last a long time, but they do have to last a few months or more to be considered a bear. But in essence, we're still in a sh we're still in a long term bull market. Um, and I have I actually have an updated version of this, but this is an eighty year history, an eighty year history of looking at a dollar, looking at a dollar. If you had a dollar in nineteen twenty six. <laughs> $1 in 1926. If you did nothing with that dollar and inflation took over, you would need $11.26 today, well, in 2006, money, to buy the exact amount of stuff $1 bought back in 1926. Okay. So inflation basically erodes the power, purchasing power of a dollar. So the purpose of investments is to beat inflation. If you're going to save your money over a long period of time, you have to make sure you're beating inflation because this dollar that you have today is going to buy less stuff in the future. Or you can look at it this way. The dollar you have today, you're going to need a lot more of those dollars to buy the same stuff this dollar can buy today. So what are your choices? Well, let's look at the money market represented by treasury bills. This is the money market. Well, that dollar would have grown to $19.29. Yes, it's more than inflation. So in essence, it's an investment that paid off for you because it's worth, your dollar is worth more than it would have been uh, without the investment. And so that's, oh, that's good, but it's not great. Well, let's go to the, uh, to the long-term bond market, long-term investing. Through government bonds, that same dollar invested in 1926 
would have given you $71 and change in 2006. So that's much, much better than inflation, as you see. Um, and so you had some growth there. Well, let's take a look at investing. If you just invested in the largest company stocks back in 1926 and you just sat on it, that dollar would have been worth $3,000 today. That's nothing else, just leaving it there for that period of time. And then the riskiest companies, what I just told you, those small caps, if you were lucky enough to buy a bunch of small caps for a buck back in 1926, uh, you would have been sitting on almost 16,000 in 2006. Um, so as you see, more risk, but higher returns, okay? More risk. So obviously long-term bonds are riskier than short-term loans. More risk, more return. Uh, large company stocks are less risky. Small company stocks are more risky. More risk, more return. But again, it's about time. It's really sort of about time. It's, you have to sort of play it out over time so you can sort of see how this all works out. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there, bring us back to our main uh, screen here and ask if there's any, any questions of what we went over that so far. I'm just gonna close that. Um, was that a decent overview for you? Okay, so, yes. okay, good. So like I said, I, I did this, uh, I've been, I had been doing this since I was in Massachusetts um, with faculty workshops. Uh, a lot of faculty don't understand investments either. So I, I put together this workshop for them uh, and I've done it a few times at Touches as well since I've been here. So uh, I start with that, um, something that I've done, and then I'm gonna go through the materials in your book after that. I have a question. Yes. Um, obviously now with 